Hi guys and welcome back to Wardle Restorations. Now today we're doing something slightly different. We're not going to be doing anything on standard gauge, but as you can tell from the title and thumbnail, we're actually going to be going to Bristol to visit Alan at Model U, who's going to give us a little bit of a behind the scenes and talk to us a little bit about how Model U came about and the process of getting scanned. And this is all part of doing the crew for the likes of the 88DS and the Class 66 that Acura Scale have coming out. So. Hopefully you guys do enjoy. Do let me know um, what you think of the video. Any feedback is always welcome in the comment section down below. And yeah, let's head over to Model U. Uh, I'm Alan Butler from Model U and we're in our new office in Bristol. So starting out in 3D printing was, it's a bit of a convoluted route really. I was, I was working in IT about 14 years ago maybe and um, I had quite a stressful job and I was looking for ways to um, just do something relaxing because my, my pastimes were DJing and bike racing which are like completely incompatible and not relaxing in the slightest. So um, I just remembered like I liked the hobby like when I was younger and I just, um, and also was really interested in the sort of Cambrian railway and, and the, the lines around there. So I just Googled like, I don't know, a bit, a bit about one of my local stations and found out all this stuff and thought, well, maybe I'll buy a little bit of track and some locos and and then in a short space of time, I sort of zeroed in on Oswestry Works as a as a subject matter, mainly because I was in a small flat and I didn't have a lot of room. But I also had gone completely mad on eBay and bought like forty locos or something like that. So I, I figured um, building like a loco works would be the perfect option. Um, and then the more I kind of got into it, I realised a lot of what I wanted to model in the works didn't actually exist in model form. Um, and I actually got chatting to a couple of guys that worked in this loco works in the, in the 50s and 60s and thought it'd be really cool to sort of represent their memories in the model. And that's, that's kind of where the scanning element came in. Um, and here we are. <laughs> From a printing perspective, the first printer I bought um, was a B9 Creations, uh, or B9 Creator, which came in kit form. It was a resin printer. And I chose that particular one because there was a guy on RM Web that was building a 2mm model of Bath station, uh, Great Western Station, not Green Park. And he'd bought this printer. It's basically a jewel jewellery printer. It, it used lost wax resin. And it was quite rudimentary. It got a um, a projector uh, slung on the back, and the projected image shone into a into a into a bath of resin, basically. And you had to focus the projector to get the image sharp in the resin. Um, so I bought one of those, and then from a scanning perspective, I had a 3D Systems iSense, which was a handheld tethered USB scanner. Uh, for for a couple of hundred pounds, um, and to be honest, that technology did me for about six years, um, because there hadn't really been anything affordable that came onto the market until recently to replace it. Now you've got the uh, piece of kit behind you. Yes, yeah, which never really in my wildest dreams I could imagine owning. When I when I first started modeling, I'd I'd, I'd seen similar things to this, but they were always really top end, like hundreds of thousands of pounds, it really aimed at um, computer gaming or, C or CGI for, for like Marvel and Disney and people like that. Um, so I just sort of bided my time <laughs> until this, this company came along and made this um, uh, fully portable. It takes maybe five minutes to set up um, so we can take it to shows, we can take it, take it out on site. Um, in the interim between the, the iSense, I did have a, a, a laser scanner from a Chinese company called um, Scantech, which was fantastic. And, and to be honest, is 
possibly slightly better resolution than the scanning booth, but it takes three or four minutes to do the scans, whereas this is two hundredth of a second. So this, this means we can do complicated poses, we can do children, we can do pets. Um, anything that's, any pose that's difficult to hold for more than a few minutes um, with the scanning booth. More importantly, it also means that pretty much anyone can use it. So I got to a point where the business was completely reliant on me um, because using the handheld scanner is quite, quite a complex process because as well as scanning, you have to constantly be sort of considering what is going to print and what isn't. Um, if you've got somewhere, someone stood there in a quite a complicated pose and you're sort of messing around trying to scan a certain element, you, you might be able to decide, well, actually, I can just do that in CAD later, just to, just to make the whole process as short as possible. So there's a lot, lots of like micro decisions you're making, whereas with this, you just go scan and it's done. It was, it was kind of a slow start, I guess, because she just she actually finding people to get scanned was the, was the biggest challenge. And I was really lucky that um, guys from the Seven Valley and Tlangotlan and uh, all customers that would, that would, like yourself, would like drive for one of the mainline companies would come in and just volunteer their help, basically. So no, there's no doubt lockdown completely supercharged everything. With, with the time that people had on their hands or people rediscovering the hobby and things like that. Um, but what I've seen really in the last three or four years, I would say, is there's, there's I think when I, f when I first started, the sort of entry bar to printing and scanning was so high because the, the printers were so unre either unreliable or extremely expensive. Whereas now we've, we've switched out from our like five figure printers that I had to ones that are like a few hundred pounds and then they're infinitely better cheaper to maintain they, they don't take any barely any calibration so there's been a kind of democratization of 3d printing and it's and it's amazing to see how many little companies are popping up some people doing it part-time some people started out part-time and then they've quit their job and doing it full-time and stuff so um, yeah the demand the demand is huge We've completely changed the way we, we do stock now. So what, what you're seeing on here is, is basically what we take to shows. So it's, it's all our popular items, which increasingly are bespoke crews made either in direct collaboration with manufacturers like Rapido or Cavalex, Curascale, Kerno, Minerva, uh, Dapol, or crews where we've made customers of lent as a loco or a stockist has lent as a loco. loco. That's basically what we do with Dapol and Hornby. Uh, sorry, with Hornby and Bachman. Um, and then the rest, we try and cover all bases, really. So we know that customers need crew where we potentially haven't got a bespoke crew for, say, a J15 or something, but we'll have a pretty good idea that this crew would fit. Um, or we just try and cover bases like animals or station staff or passengers. Um, on the detailing side, it's lamps, um, our guttering um, system or shed details, diesel, diesel shed details and loco shed details. Um, amazingly, best selling wise, guttering is always in our top three every month. So we barely even promote it, but the, gut, the guttering is like our, our best seller. Um, after that, 009 has been immense since Bachman have, have focused on that so much. We've, We've done a crew for pretty much for every single loco they've produced and they all sell and regularly people will buy all of them. So the 009 cruise has been, has been really good. Um, from a production perspective, we just found, I think in the catalogue there was about 3,000 items or something like that. And for a long time, if something was out of stock, we would print three, at least three, maybe 10 replacements and they would go into stock. So when an order comes in, we would just be able to pick them. But what we found is as the range was growing, it was that, that method was completely grinding us to a halt, basically. So if one thing was out of stock, we'd spend, spend seven times the amount of time delivering it because we'd be printing seven more, packing seven more. Um, so now we print everything to order, which has meant we're, we're, we're on two to three days turnaround. So working with the manufacturers has made an absolutely enormous difference. Um, a, it means that the 
development time is so much faster because in, in some cases um, we actually have the CAD. So we've, we've signed, signed NDAs and things so we can get CAD pre-release before things have been announced. So we can, we can do a scan, we can introduce the, the, the scan figure into the CAD digi digitally and make, make all the adjustments before we've even printed anything. So um, that, that's made an enormous difference to the accuracy of what we can produce. Um, especially in particular with Acura scale because we're then getting those figures mass produced, print, 3D printed in colour, so they need to be completely accurate. Um, yeah. It's also meant that from our own perspective, from our, from our sort of marketing and social media perspective, having companies like Rapido and Acura scale talk about what we do is completely, you know, amplifies our voice in a way that we could never do ourselves. Um, so that their, their reach, obviously, as, as big companies, is much further than ours. So that that's made a massive difference. Um, and to be honest, it's also pushed us as well. Like it's pushed us well beyond our, um, you know, what was what was the norm for us. I think it started with Acura Scale asking us to print some EPs for them. So the sort of pressure level goes through the roof. You know, sort of need a. I think it was like the class 50 in a week before. Ali Pali or Wally or something like that, um, which we, which we we did we did do, but we were sort of sweating for a week that it would be up to like their standard, you know. So only our standards have to become a Kira scale standard, um, and the same with Rapido. We've been printing prototypes for them as well, um, which we kind of like. Now we now we understand. So print, printing a figure to printing a. I don't know, like the Y7 or something like that is a completely different ball game in, in every way. And it needs to be, it needs to stand up to scrutiny because it's going to be on an exhibition stand, photoed and looked at by all the magazines and stuff. So that's, um, we've really had to step up a lot to, to, uh, to match that. So the biggest, biggest prints we've done is probably our 1 12th figures. And I, I have a feeling we might have done a 1 10th for somebody. I think we we did a 66 driver just just from the waist up, but in one tenth, I mean, it was like this this big. But we've done one twelfth figures, which is sort of obviously up here, like sort of like I can't remember if that same scale as Action Men, it might be one eighth. Um, uh, we've done, I mean, to be honest, some of the locos that we've done, double O locos we've done, were quite big. I think the the last tender loco we did for Rapido was sort of like this this kind of length. Um, and we've done some coaches for Kira scale, which, were, which are challenging because of the warpage. Warpage is like really difficult to deal with with coaches and um, frames and things like that. Um, in terms of what I'd like to print, I'm really, really intrigued about seeing people printing buildings. I, I had pondered, there's a, there's a great Western coaling stage up there. I pondered like a completely single, single print, which the printers would do. Um, yeah, yeah, probably buildings, I think. Yeah, Dan, Dan painting has been like, it, it, our products are nothing without the painting of them, obviously. And, and the sort of, the magic that Dan brings to them is just incredible. Like, um, it's, it's kind of, kind of hard to put it into words really, because he's, he's such a pro, like the speed that he does it is, completely mind-blowing but the, qu the, high, the quality is, t is totally totally crazy so yeah work working with Dan has been immense like um, and then again like the reach that he has as well it's just sort of we kind of piggyback onto that with with the, his abilities um, but he sort of regularly feeds back into us with some of the project that he does for his clients so we might do a completely new range to, to support one of his projects I think recently we did um He's got a scrapyard scene to do, so we've done like guys with oxyacetylene torches and um, cutting cutting bits up. So we've sort of had to do a bit of research into the kind of equipment they use and the clothing they wear and stuff like that. But no, I mean it's it's um, and, and Dan has built us a, a, a loads of dioramas for for our to pose our figures on and um, yeah, I mean he's really the icing on the cake. So yeah, I think color printing will become more and more part of what we do. So at the moment we're doing it in, in bulk to a Cura scale, but I feel like there'll be a, maybe a few product lines 
where we might introduce colour options, probably cap like diesel crews, I think, realistically, because the resin is still quite brittle and doesn't really suit handling a lot. So I, I feel like um, diesel, diesel electrics in particular, and potentially passengers, where they can just be plonked in and, and you don't touch them again. Uh, so that would be one development. I think uh, another, another area which we've, we've been experimenting with for about six months now is a Patreon subscription where people subscribe and they get figures to print themselves every month. So we've got 100 subscribers now. We're on our seventh month and the subscribers, a certain tier, determine what we produce each month. So they, they um, will have a suggestions open forum for suggestions, we'll, we'll collate the suggestions, put them up for a poll, and then what gets voted on is what we make. Um, that's going great, that's going, that's going really good, and I'd, I'd really like to see that get into hundreds of subscribers, really, because I feel with that we can, we can reach a lot of different markets. And with, with this kit, and, and we use a film and TV costume hire company as well, so those two things combined, the, the potential is like absolutely enormous. So if customers that want to get scanned, they can book in with us here in Bristol or they can come and visit us at an exhibition. Um, so this year we've got, uh, we've got Ali Pali in March. We'll be at the new Hornby or Key Model World one in the NEC in April. We'll be at Bristol in May. And then in the summer we've got a few new events. I think we're going to try a hand at Miniatura in August. Um, and then potentially Wally again if it's back on by the sounds of things um, and then we're, we're going to do a few one day sh events at um, like we're at Rails of Sheffield in September and I think those kind of things have worked really well in the past we actually did a three day event like that at Hatton's God rest their soul yes a few years ago which was excellent um, so we do also, depending on the number of people that want to get scanned, we can visit like a club um, and do like a day scanning at a club. If, if there's sort of 20 odd people that want to get scanned, then we'll, we'll go up for the day. Thank you very much. Thanks, mate. Thanks for coming. So, guys, that is where we're going to leave it for today's video. Hopefully you guys did enjoy. And thank you once again to Alan for inviting me down to um, show me how all the scanning works, get some scans done and for the small interview he did as well. I really do appreciate it. Um, and hopefully if you're seeing this, um, it came out all right. But yeah, I'd also like to thank you as well for this lovely mystery box, which I believe, I think you said, will be out um, at the upcoming shows. Um, I could be wrong, but it's basically um, spare scans and things they've had from uh, prints, and they've put them all into various mystery boxes. I am building an O-Gage diorama at the moment for the 88DS, so I went for the O-Gage one. And um, if you want to see what's in this, I will post a link to my Facebook page and I'll put pictures on there as to what I get um, so you can see for yourself. And um, yeah, very pleased with that, so thank you. But yeah, if you guys did enjoy, please do hit the thumbs up. As I mentioned, any feedback, leave it in the comment section below and I will catch you all in the next video. Cheers.